Open your Bibles to Luke 16, please. Luke chapter 16 is where we are. Glad to see everybody here tonight. We have a few visitors with us. We have quite a few on the live stream. And uh, glad to have everybody in on this study. Of course, if you're on the live stream, uh, I can see the questions. If you have any questions or comments, I can see them. So feel free to do that. Anybody else need an outline? Anybody else? All right. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so we started this last week, and uh, what I want to actually think about is what Paul says. I call it, I'm talking about death in the afterlife, but I like the way the Holy Spirit frames it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I'm going to turn over there just real quick. 1 Corinthians 15. And verse 24 beginning. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So that's the concept of this class, the last enemy. We started out looking at it last week, strictly physically, what death is. We looked at that definition, the irreversible cessation of all vital functions, especially as indicated by permanent stoppage of the heart, respiration, and brain activity. We looked at Genesis 35, 18, kind of as an introductory thought, where Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin, and it says that her spirit departed from her, and then in parentheses it says, for she died. So we understand that there's more than just the physical cessation. There's a, there's a spiritual component to death, too. Um... Just looked at some statistics. In 2018, there were 17.4 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births, as opposed to 600 deaths per 100,000 live births of deaths of the mother. And we talked about the fact just a minute that the one thing that really changed that statistic was washing your hands. So we've learned a lot over the years about death and some preventatives, well, that's, that's completely the wrong way to say it. Uh, some helps to prevent, perhaps, some premature deaths. Maybe that's a better way to say it. James 2 and verse 26, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And that, that coincides with Genesis 35, 18. We looked at those two verses, Matthew 27, 50, and John 19, verse 30, where the Bible says that Jesus... The King James says, yielded up the ghost and uh, or gave up the ghost. And the New King James says, yielded or gave up the spirit. And the way it's phrased actually in the Greek is he let it go. He released it. And we talked about that a little bit that I've had experiences like that. And I'm sure you have too, where it's almost as if a loved one were hanging on to see someone. And when that someone gets there, they tell them it's okay, you can go. And they do. It's death is, uh, I guess, in some ways, a mystery like that. We talked about the fact that our physical bodies can only take so much. We looked at all the means, well, not all of them, but some of the means of death in the Bible, drowning, old age. Samson was crushed. Absalom was stabbed. Some people ate their own children during a siege of Jerusalem. Uh, who's the guy that built the gallows? Haman, Haman's gallows, so people were hanged, crucifixion, stoning, beheading. So uh, a lot of ground covered there. And this is where we kind of quit last week. Um, you're only going to die once, according to the biblical record. It's appointed unto men to die once. The Greek term for once is hapix, and it means one time. Jesus died once and for all for the sins of the world. The book of Hebrews tells us as well. The faith was once and for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. That's the same word. One time, you die one time. It happens to everybody, the animals and humans, the rich, the poor. 
Um, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. What were we looking at there? Let me, let me refresh myself here real quick on that passage. Oh, yeah. This when David was dying. He said, I'm going, going the way of all the earth. Joshua said that same thing, too, at the end of that book. And then we looked at some passages in Genesis where it tells us, and, and we'll get into this in a different lesson, but the idea of someone dying and being gathered to their people, the idea of a reunion, if you will, um, after death. So we're going to be in Luke 16, but I, we're going to start out tonight. So a question came through on the live stream after class was over last week, and it's kind of jumping ahead, but I said I would address them when I saw them. So let's go ahead and address that first. And the question was this. It was framed this way. Why is it that people, when their loved one dies who has not been living right, why do people say they went to heaven? That was the question. And my answer to that is, my, my immediate answer to that was, well, it's, that's a source of comfort. To think that you've lost a loved one and they've gone to heaven. But it was framed with, when we know they haven't lived right. So let me say a couple of things about that. Um, number one, you and I are not the judge. Okay. We could, we could just, for instance, we could see somebody at the church building every time the doors are open. Does that mean they're going to heaven? Of course not. Um, but on the opposite end of that spectrum, it's kind of like Jesus said of false teachers in Matthew 7 and verse 15, by their fruits, you will know them. I think what people are doing when they say something like that is comforting themselves. Um, now, as a Christian, I think it is a different story. There's certainly comfort in knowing that my loved one, whatever the connection is with them, died the death of the righteous, as the Bible talks about. And I think there's, I have no doubt in my mind, in fact, that there is um, confidence that we find in Scripture that that is the case, that a loved one who has lived faithfully, that we know uh, personally, for instance, maybe a, a parent or a spouse or a child or something like that that we're close to, and we know, we know them. If you've lived a faithful Christian life and you've walked in the light, what's the promise? Hereby we know that we know Him, what? If what? If we keep His commandments. You can know that. And you can know also, you look at 1 John 5, verses, particularly verses 11, and 12, 11 through 13. We know that we have eternal life and that life is in His Son. But you have to continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You have to continue to be faithful. Belief is more than just the mental acceptance that God exists and that Jesus is His Son. Biblical faith always involves action. It always involves obedience. So to answer that question for one of the viewers was, uh, I, I, I think that's it. People tell, them that, tell themselves that in, in, a, in an effort to comfort themselves in a time of great loss and grief. But we do need to be careful because we are not the judge. I, I've even changed personally, and I'll just tell you about myself, I've even changed the way I conduct funerals over the years. Um, as a preacher, I can only know so much about you. I know a lot more about Gail and Sarah and Garrett, but I don't live with you. I don't know everything about you. And I will not preach anyone into heaven. That's not my job. You know, then that's, I think oftentimes that's what we see in funerals is, um, and I, I, I mean, I've seen it and I know you have, um, that that's almost the goal of whoever's ministering to the family is to preach that person into heaven. It's not my job. As a minister, my job is to do whatever I can to uh, bring comfort to the family and things like this. And that's, that's I guess I would say that's nearly impossible to do. I mean, you just, you can't, there, there are no words that you can say that can do that. There's nothing you can craft to come up with to, oh, I feel so much better after you said that. 
my thought is they, whoever's dealing with the loss probably doesn't remember a thing that I said that day. And that's okay. Anyway, any questions or comments on all that before we go back to Luke 16? All right. So we started looking last week at what some consider to be a parable and what some consider to be a real story. I talked a little bit about that last week. Some people believe this is not a parable because somebody's name is used. Well, so what? <laughs> Whatever the case may be, the same truths are being taught. Whether it was an actual event or a parable, it doesn't matter. The same truth has been revealed here. So let's break down the text and then we'll, we'll talk about our main points uh, that you don't have on your outline because that's from last week. So you have to make some notes if you want to. So you look at their situations in life. Um, a certain rich man, we talked about this, wealthy, well-to-do, Lazarus, complete opposite. Uh, homeless, completely dependent on the charity of others, full of sores, starving. Those, those are your, their lots in life, and then you have their deaths. And the, the description, talked about this a little bit last week, to me is stark. The contrast is stark. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abram's, Abraham's bosom. And the word bosom means the place between the arms. And, you know, when we think of a place of comfort, it's a place of being held. And uh, that signifies comfort, as the text later tells us, that he was in comfort. So he dies and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that works. But that's what the biblical text reveals uh, for the death of one who is right with God. You know, the Bible tells us, so I started, yes, was it yesterday? I started uh, Hebrews on our daily live stream. And at the end of Hebrews chapter 1, it says they are all ministers, angels, talking about angels. They are ministers. They are servants. They, and they are, as the book of Revelation says, there are thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They are innumerable. In fact, Hebrews 12 tells us that the angels are innumerable. And they work. And we know a bit about them from the biblical record, but there's a lot we don't know. One thing that's told to us here is that this man died. He was going to comfort what Jesus would tell the thief on the cross. You remember on the cross, where did Jesus tell the thief he was going that day? Paradise, Paradise okay. Um, that's from an old Persian word that means garden. Uh, kind of a walled, an enclosure, a park. Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, and however it works, he was escorted there by the angels. The rich man died and was buried. He didn't get any extravagant departure. Uh, but what he did get was he lifted up his eyes. And a couple things I want to note here, and I touched on it last week. Uh, starts in verse 23. If you're looking at a King James, it says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. The New King James says, And being in torments in Hades. And Hades is the correct translation. Hell, the, when you see the English word hell in your Bible, and I think it appears nine times in the Bible. I think that's right, nine times. Uh, it comes from the Greek word Gehenna, which is talking about a lake of fire. That's... And it's a, in fact, it's even phrased that way, for instance, in Revelation chapter 20, the lake of fire. It's Gehenna. That's the eternal abode of the unrighteous where they will go after judgment. Gehenna. This is Hades. And do you remember what the word Hades means? The unseen. The, I mean, the word itself and the way it looks, if you're looking at a New King James, you see it in English. H-A-D-E-S. That's exactly how it's spelled in the Greek language. And it simply means unseen. Well, we know it means the unseen realm. It's where the dead go. It's where all the dead go. Every person who dies goes to the realm of the unseen. Um, I'm not finished yet, but not to the same. Every dead person, every person who dies goes to Hades. Some go to torment. Now, 
that's the opposite of paradise. There are two parts to Hades. There's a place of torment and there's a place of comfort. And that's one of the truths that this parable teaches us um, about the afterlife. And you know, there are a lot, when you look at a lot of ancient civilizations, um, whether you're talking about things like the Aztecs or the Egyptians or even American Indians, uh, and I guess one that perhaps you and I are most familiar with are the Egyptian practices because of the, you know, the archaeological work that's been done over in Egypt and the pyramids and the, the Valley of the Kings. I, was, I watched a documentary a while back on the Valley of the Kings. It's amazing to see the work that the Egyptians did to prepare their pharaohs and other leaders for the afterlife. Um, the process of embalming. It's amazing that they had that capability, but they believed, one of the things they believed was the heart. They, one of the organs they would take out and put in a jar was the heart because they believed in the afterlife. I forget which god it was, but one of the gods would take the person's heart and put it on a scale, and on the other side of the scale was a feather. And if it balanced out, that was good. So there, there are a lot of uh, different ideas out there about the afterlife, but the Bible reveals to us that there is a place after we die that's called Hades that has, I guess, I don't know if this is a good word, but two compartments, two areas. One is a place of torment, one is a place of comfort. So I'm going to read this from the New King James. The reason being is because the King James repeatedly uses this word hell, and that's just wrong. So... Uh, Verse 23, being in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, Lazarus between his arms. Now, here's the thing. People aren't sitting in Abraham's lap in Hades, okay? That's, that's not what this is, but the imagery is a place of comfort, a place of rest. Then he cried and said, Father, uh, Father Abraham, which tells us this is a Jewish man that died, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And the word here, adonao, means in physical distress, in physical pain and suffering. Um, I don't know how to explain that. That's what the word means. But the body is in a grave, isn't it? Somewhere. When Jesus died, he went to Hades, but where was his body? Well, his body was in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, wasn't it? Whatever the case may be, this is a, plain, uh, this is a place, a plane of existence of torment and flame. So let me, uh, you've got the rich man's plight, you've got the, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So we're looking at the rich man's plight. He's in distress of body. In Hades. But Abraham said, Son, remember, and this is going to come out later. Um, I think what I'll just do is read through this and then I'll pull up the PowerPoint as I go through. Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, that is, placed firmly. Fixed means set, it's fixed, it's not going anywhere. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Point being, once you die, that is it. You're either you're going to paradise or you're going to, to be in a place of torment. That's it. The gulf is fixed. So you've got the rich man's plight there in verses 23 to 26. And then you have the pre-death reality. Because Abraham talks to him about, or he talks to Abraham about some things that that we, what we talked about last week, that he is conscious of. I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him. And I noticed this twice now. First of all, send him to me. Well, we can't do that. All right, then send him. He's still got this mindset of superiority, doesn't he? Money can do that to people, can it? Give them a sense of entitlement. I deserve this. Whatever, special treatment. That's certainly what he's asking for here. Send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Uh, that, they, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So torment comes up, uh, what, four, 
four times in this text. Verse, um, verse 22, verse 24, 25, and then again, 28. So he is conscious. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. Imagine arguing with Abraham. You're in torments and you're going to sit there and argue with somebody. It, to me, that shows you don't lose, and this will be a, a class that we talk about this too, you don't lose your, um, your identity in death. You are you. You're in a different state, you're in a different plane of existence, if you will. That's a good way to say it, but you are still you. No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to him from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. You think about the times where Jesus would perform a miracle and people would say, it's like in the next chapter, well, give us a sign and we'll believe. That's not how it works. All right. So let's look at some things that are obvious in the text here. I think I've got, I think I've got five or six things here. Number one, pain. We've already talked about that. Uh, the rich man in Hades lifted up his eyes in torment. So again, this is the, Hades is the realm of, of the unseen where everybody goes. And there's a place of torment, of pain. And again, I don't know how that works because you think of how could you experience pain without your nerve endings and things? I don't know. But that's the way it's described, place of pain. Um, let's do this real quick. Somebody turn over, please, to uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 and read verses 7 through 9. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Now, this is talking about the return of Christ and what will take place after that. He's, written, he's writing to Christians here who are under persecution. So understand all that first. All right, somebody read that. same language, don't you? But again, this is referring to after the Lord returns. Um, you have rest for those who are being troubled, verse 7, for those who are being persecuted and yet remain righteous. But then you have flaming fire and vengeance on two groups of people, those who do not know God. And, that word, and I've talked to you about this before. You know, we get into speculation. Well, what if there's an island out there somewhere that the gospel's never gone and they've never heard? Will God send them to hell? And they'll, they'll reference this verse. That's not what this verse is saying. The word here in the Greek language means takes no interest in. It's not that they've never heard of God or His word. It's um, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them who take no interest in God and who do not obey the gospel. They're going to be separated from God forever. It's a place of pain. Secondly, it is a place of consciousness. And consciousness is... You're aware, you have memory, um, aware, you know, you know what's going on in your surroundings. He could see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And it was, I think it was, point, I think somebody pointed out last week, perhaps one of the reasons it's comfort for Lazarus is because we're never told whether he can see into torment. I, I think the implication is he can't. He just knows he's in comfort. But it's a place of conscious existence and both comfort and uh, torment. They both know what's going on. Well, it's another form of torment for the one in torment to see the other in comfort. Sure. Uh, and that is another form of torture, really. Mm. 
If you're in comfort and you know a loved one is in torment, how can you be comforted? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the implication so far as we have here in Luke 16 is that what, um, what Lazarus knew was he was in comfort. We're not told, like, we're given everything that the rich man could see and what he could feel. Um, I think that's one of those things that there's not a, like, I can give you texts on the torment. I can give you texts on the pain and the separation and I know a lot of people use Revelation 21 and 22, and I think that's okay. I think there's a principle there in Revelation 21 and 22 that God will wipe away every tear from their eye. But the implication there is there's crying because if there weren't, why would He have to wipe away your tears? That's something different than, than the afterlife. Uh, all we have from this text is that He was comforted. And I suppose that God will take care of that. I, and I know that seems like a, a non-answer, but I just, I don't know. I don't know. Anything, anybody else? Well, this is something that's been discussed a long time, because I remember my mom and dad talking about it when I was a little kid. The same thing we're talking about. Yeah. And I think that that's about the only thing they could come up with is you couldn't be comforted if you knew yeah. So if you, you had a loved one, if your husband or your wife was in torment, yeah. you would not be comforted. Right. So you can't know. Is there any in scripture that gives us an idea as to whether we're going to know? Okay. You, you said that we're not we're, we're kinda we're still gonna kinda be who you were. Mm. You know, you're, you're, You'll be self aware, conscious. Yeah. Right. Have any of you seen that painting, The First Moments in Heaven? And the picture is people hugging. Well, you know, there, there, are, there are several passages, act, act, several passages actually that talk to us about something along those lines. Turn to Matthew 8 and read verse 11 for us, for us, for us, please. Yeah. And we always hear about Peter at the pearly gates. For some reason. Yeah, but Abraham is actually talking to yeah. this man. So yes. He knows what's going on. Correct. That, that, that may mean that everybody else does too, and you, you just don't feel sorry for him because you, you made it to comfort. I don't know. Yeah. Matthew 8 11, go ahead. Okay, Abraham lived about 2,500 years before Christ, so he's dead, and Isaac and Jacob, and yet, and then you also you go to Matthew 17 and look at the Mount of Transfiguration, and who does Jesus appear with on the mount? Anybody remember? Moses and Elijah. Okay, so you're separated there by Moses 1,500 years, Elijah about 900 years or so, and yet Peter, Andrew, James, and John knew who they were. There's obviously recognition and the concept of a reunion, if you will, if you want to use that term. And that's, we're going we're gonna to have a class on that too, by the way. It, look at all the texts that talk about that. Because you know, that would have to be, uh, again, that's something we're not really told. It would have to be kind of miraculous. Because how am I supposed to know who Moses is? You know? Right. See, unless it's like a family reunion, where your name is there. Well, he's carved in the halls of Congress, isn't he? Isn't there a picture of Moses in Congress? Yeah, yeah. I've seen black Jesus and oriental Jesus and et cetera. Can it mean that we know how the people that are in comfort with us and we don't have awareness of who they are? I mean, we can know and recognize him without realizing he's not there or he's in torment. Can that be? I think that is a possible. Gail's asking, is it possible that we, while we can be aware and recognize those who are with us in comfort. 
assuming we get there. <laughs> we remain faithful. Uh, well, I was answering her question. Uh, I think that is the, the thing, is that kind of what I told, was saying to Sandy, I think it's hard for us to imagine that now because we have memory and conscious, we're conscious of people who are alive and people who are dead and all of that. And there seems to be on the side of comfort in Hades, it seems that that's taken care of. Otherwise, it wouldn't be comfort. I mean, that's why it's called comfort, because you're comforted. And I think the way Sandy asked it kind of answers the question. Go ahead. We will understand all of that. Yeah. So there's, and what, he said we will understand all at that time. So there's a verse that kind of addresses maybe what we're dealing with, and that's Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. But the things that have been revealed to us belong to us and to our children that we may keep all the words of this law. There are some things we just don't know. Just like with angels, you know. I, there's a lot we don't know. And I think that's the same with death and what happens in the moments after that. And then how are you comforted when this is possible? And Right. Right now, we are so, well, we're, we're, the word we use is finite. And there's so many things we don't see. And, and that's another thing we kind of touched on last week is there's a whole level of existence that we will never see. Okay, so sometime read the last four chapters of Daniel. Don't try to, don't read it trying to figure out what everything means, but just notice the angels, the princes, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, the prince of Israel, Michael and Gabriel. There's a whole plane of existence that we can't even see. It's in the book of Ephesians, I think it uses the word five or six times, in the heavenlies. We're not in the heavenlies. But that's not talking about heaven either, where God is. So I think we have to kind of figure that into everything we're talking about too, is that there's, there's a spiritual warfare in spiritual places that we don't see, you can't sense, and we just don't have all the answers to. And I think some of the things we're talking about now is part of that discussion. But don't we, Terry, don't we think, though, that there's a lot of, people, a lot of Christians who go through lives and they lose loved ones who they, they know weren't Christians and they know won't, you know. Sure. Right. Yeah. I I just think there's a there's a lot that we don't know about it that we will one day. I, it's, it's hard to answer, I guess. Yeah. Knowing the, the, well, it's like was said of God in Genesis 18, the judge of all the earth will do what's right. God is a just God. And his decision's right. He doesn't mess anything up. That's a good point. I've got a comment here on the live stream. In Luke 12, 48, are the additional stripes speak, somebody turn over to Luke 12, please, and read 47 and 48. In Luke 12, 48, are the additional stripes speaking of one who receives the added stripes, referring to the mental anguish of having known but failed to do or not do. Somebody read Luke 12, 47 and 48, please. Him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask for more. 
So, to Mark, who answered that question, yes. It's this idea of responsibility, opportunity, ability, and a failure to meet all of that. And, the, the, and, and Peter talks about this too in Second Peter, that those who knew the commandment and then turned away from it, what did he say about them? It had been better if they had not even heard it and to have known it and turned away from it. So I think that, that is a... And, and again, that points to consciousness, doesn't it? If you can have that kind of mental anguish, you're a conscious being. You're aware of the... Well, just like here in Luke 16, I've got five brothers at home. Send somebody. So, yes. You've got memory. We've already talked about that. You've got the sense of superiority. Maybe, I think a better word there is entitlement. Hey, send Lazarus to me. Send Lazarus to them. And you have permanence. It's a great gulf fixed. There is nowhere to go. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. And of course we understand, there's, it's like Acts 17 says, uh, 30 and 31. He's appointed a day in which he will judge the world, and to what you were saying, Mr. Ricky, in righteousness. He's going to do it right. You know, how many cases do we hear, sometimes big stuff, of that you know, evidence is missed or things that come out years later through DNA testing and either person is, um, what's the word, not absolved. What's the word, Steve? Exonerated. Exonerated. Thank you. Is that it? <laughs> Can't even spell it. Uh, or condemned because some evidence came out years later. That's not going to happen with God. He's going to get it right every time. Oh, anything else? I think we're... Would, would this be the thing for you in, in Hades? You're like saying that this is where you will be until, the, until time ends, and then it will be party left and right? Yes. Hades is where everybody goes when they die. And Matthew 25 gives us a great imagery, beginning in verse 31, where Christ is seated on His throne and all nations will be gathered before Him. The sheep go to the right, the goats go to the left. There's a separation. And, and really, that's the way to look at Judgment Day. And I've talked about that here before. You don't, we're not going to stand in line, single file, and go one by one and be judged by God. The Day of Judgment really is the announcement day. Um, it's the separation day. And the right and the left, well done and depart from me, I never knew you. That's, that, that's really what we call a judgment day is like. But you, You're not really in heaven yet. Right. You're in this, so then after the judgment day, then you'll be in heaven. And, and right. After judgment day is when, you know, I talked about hell earlier in the, the lake of fire. That and, and then heaven, where the Father is is uh, post-judgment day. Hades is pre-judgment day. Yes. Right. Once you're in Hades, and that's you know, one of the great things about this text, we are, it's revealed to us, at death you know. Yeah, that's 1 Thessalonians 4 that Pam brings out. Um, and on the, the last day, it's often pictured by people in, as kind of chaos and just people running everywhere and cars driving off the road when the Lord comes back. No, it's going to be orderly. And 1 Thessalonians 4, and 1 Thessalonians 4 talks only about the Christian perspective. It doesn't talk about non-believers. There's an order. Those, well, those who have died are going to come with Him. And then we who are alive, well, then the dead in Christ will be raised, the physical resurrection. And then those who have not died yet, we'll go to meet him in the air. And then, and that's where maybe, Mr. Stan, uh, verse 17 says, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Prior to that point, though, we're not until he returns and we meet him in the air to be with him forever. I'm sorry? Yes, when you get your new body. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Uh, we, our lowly body will be transformed into a glorious body like unto His. 1 John 3 tells us, this is interesting. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says, we don't know what it's going to be like, 
John said, and this is an inspired apostle, we don't know what it's going to be like, but we know it'll be like his because we'll see him as he is. That's when all that's going to happen. Hmm? That's the judgment. The, 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 what we call the second coming of Christ, the separation day. Yes, that's the physical resurrection. Our bodies are going to come forth, John 5, 28 and 29. Correct. Because your body's in the tomb, just like Jesus was. Exactly. Okay, so you're, but even in that spiritual form, you're still going to recognize Jesus. Yes. That's very, very helpful. Yep. Okay, guys. Very Appreciate it. it. Absolutely.